locate in your Bibles Psalm 90. Psalm 90. And I'm going to read from verse 1. This is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end. By your anger and by your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath and we bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice And be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. And for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants. And your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes. Yes. Establish the work of our hands. As I shared with you during the the notices, it has not been a particularly easy week. It's fair to say it's been actually um, a rather rough week that has left me more than a little battered, feeling at times quite stretched. I described it to someone as, uh, as too little jam over too much very dry bread and having little opportunity at one point in the week actually toward the end of the week to devote my normal time to study and preparation for this morning I was somewhat exasperated why would things pan out in such a way that I I couldn't spend the amount of dedication and time I might normally. And then it occurred to me that actually the things that I was observing, the things that I was experiencing were the preparation. That God in His providence so arranged the events of the week to draw me to this psalm. And to bring its meaning home in a very deep and personal way. Of course, pastoral ministry is very much like this past week. There are wonderful highs. The prayer meeting on Thursday was a rich blessing to me. The men getting together in my flat and praying together Tuesday night was a rich blessing to me. 
teaching God's word, preaching God's word is a massive privilege. Yes, it's a weight, but it's one that I gladly bear. And I hope that all who have that task do so with thankfulness and rejoicing. There's the privilege that I've had of serving several of you in a range of specific practical needs with which you needed assistance. And I'm always more than happy to help. Please never, never for a moment think in light of the things that I say this morning that I'm too busy or too weary to talk, too busy to help, too busy to send a text or to speak over the phone. Yes, it might not be pleasant, but I'd rather join you in whatever unpleasantness than be totally left out. Because God has given me a noble task, a great task, and one which I cherish to know and love each of you as brothers and sisters and to minister to you according to the calling that God has placed on my life. Yeah, there's, there's always the unfortunate, usual, wearisome rubbish as well. The things that people say and do, which really they shouldn't. Things that sometimes end up being laid at my feet. And the reminder that accompanies such things, that we are sinners. That we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And a reminder that challenges any narcissistic impulses in myself just as a man but as a pastor as well that in truth I am not Jesus and I'm not the Holy Spirit I cannot convict I cannot save I cannot free and I cannot keep people from their sins I can't even do these things for myself. I cannot cannot solve the many problems that come as a result of sin now or in the past. Problems that maybe you face this very week. Consequences of sin directly or indirectly. I can only try to come alongside you and help you in those moments. I can only help you by trying at least to patiently point you to the Savior. Knowing that though I am a leader in the household of faith, I too walk with a limp. What makes all of these things, these little things that can populate our week so um, frustrating is that they are voluntary choices. So if you send... If I send, let's not talk about difficulty. It's, it's, it's kind of the thing to, to do when someone's, you know, sinning. They're, they're like, oh, I, I'm having, you know, it's, it's not been easy for me. It's, been, it's, it's difficult. I know I've said that same thing before myself. But let's not talk about difficulty when it comes to sin. Let's talk about easy. Because sin is easy. Foolishness is easy. Obedience, faithfulness, sacrifice, selfless service, that is difficulty. But really what's made this week a bit rough is not the headaches, it's the heartaches. It's not the things that people said and did that they had a say in, but it's the things that people happen, the the things that happened to people that they had no say in, at least directly. For example, people don't choose to die. People don't choose to be sick. And yet they do, and they are. And so if you came to church this morning expecting me to be um, all... um, peppy and you know motivational and happy that's not reality sometimes you should have been here last week we had we had a nice time and we had lunch we stayed for hours enjoying fellowship 
you should have been in my flat Tuesday night with the other guys. We had a lot of banter and um, some, some good times of prayer as well. But the scripture tells us there's a time to mourn and there's a time to grieve. And I, I, I'm having to be honest with you this morning. It, I, it's very tempting for me to um, weep through the whole of this morning's message. I may get around to it eventually. Because death and disease are real. And I do feel that I've walked closely with these things this week. Some of you, Sister Noma, for example, you work in a hospital. You must think I'm such a lightweight. But these things, when they happen, when they touch our church, we have to, we have to talk about them. We have to deal with them. If we don't, we'll end up like so many fragile people who have never seen a dead person before, who've never attended a funeral, who've never walked with people through grief, who I'm afraid when grief happens, as I've experienced it in many people's lives in this area, turn to alcoholism and drug abuse and uh, other self-harming coping mechanisms Because they don't know how to grieve. They've never experienced grief. They've never seen grief modeled. And so this morning, even if it's just me who feels like I'm sad, um, I, I, I want to model in some way, so far as I can, what it's like to grieve as a follower of Christ who himself wept at the loss of a friend. On Tuesday, I was in a meeting and I was discussing various ministry opportunities with a dear brother who um, uh, has, has behind the scenes in ways that most of you do not know or appreciate. Uh, you barely know the man yourself has really been a blessing and an encouragement both to me personally as your pastor and to our congregation. I mentioned a church that he had connected me with in uh, the USA who um, were planning, perhaps still are planning, to help us at some point this summer, uh, doing work particularly, it would seem, with, with, with children right before and after the uh, school holiday. This man I met uh, a year and a half ago. We knocked on doors together. We talked about the area. We shared the good news of Jesus we prayed with people. I barely met him. I barely knew him. He was a brother in Christ, though, a deacon in his local church in South Carolina. And to be honest, I don't think I would have recognized him if he had walked into the, the room after that one incident. But um, uh, I met him again in October and he came up to me and I, it was like, oh, I know I should recognize you. You act like you know me. You act like you've met me before, but I don't know who you are. I didn't actually tell him that. I, I just sort of smiled, nodded. And then he told me the church he was from. And, and then I was like, oh, yes, yes, of course. Um, I meet many people, you know, and so uh, I, I forget some that don't see them often. He then asked if he could have a card with our church's details on it, uh, the picture of the church and all of that. You've seen the card, You've taken them and given them out yourself. Um, and I said, yes, of course. And he said, thank you. I, I, I lost yours. And then I, I remembered I'd, I'd given him a card when he was here and uh, and, and, and inexplicably, really, to me at the time, he, he began to to get a bit weepy, a bit teary-eyed. And he said, I was so impacted by the time that I had with you last year. And I lost it and I was so upset because I had kept it in the front of my Bible. And every time I opened my Bible to pray and read in the morning at the start of my day, I would see your card and I would pray for you and Grace Baptist Church would grieve. And I'd pray that God would keep you strong. And I'd pray that God would help you. 
and that God would bless you and that God would save the nations around you. I barely knew the man. None of you have met him. That's my last memory of him. And it will have to be. Because as I was mentioning, uh, trying to get in touch with him to arrange some ways of partnering together in gospel work here, my friend interrupted me and waved waved me off and said, Ryan, um, he died last week. He had a massive heart attack. And he's with the Lord. Teach us to number our days. On Wednesday, I spoke with Nina, Nikki's daughter, over the phone. She told me that her 91-year-old mom was in the hospital and had entered palliative care. She said it could be an hour, it could be all night, but she's not long for this world. I was supposed to be chairing the local residents association meeting. I handed it over to someone else to take charge of. Swiftly changed into a tie because I didn't want this nonsense of, oh, you can't, you can't, it's after visiting hours, you know, um, uh, if I can flex my um, uh, pastoral muscle um, and I have to conform to their cultural dress code expectations, then so be it. And I rushed to Whittington Hospital, where I found Nikki as I'd never seen her, though she was very old and increasingly frail. She still walked. I always saw her upright, walking with her trolley for probably the past decade, or sitting up, and here she was on her back, Breathing very painfully, unconscious since two in the morning. I was with her and enjoyed, such as it was in the circumstances, my last time with her. I placed my hand on her arm and I read the scriptures to her. I read about the Lord being our shepherd and leading us to the valley of the shadow of death. I read about Jesus being the good shepherd and those who believe in him being guided by him even into eternity. I just crossed the page from there to Jesus standing before the tomb of his friend Lazarus and weeping but turning to the sisters of his friend and saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And the one who believes in me shall never die. And I continued with the words of the Apostle Paul. What shall separate me from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord? Nothing shall separate me, shall separate us from that love. I continue to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Some of the last sermons Nikki would have heard sat in this very hall would have been those messages from late December on the resurrection as we considered the resurrection in light of the incarnation. And we, uh, we, we thought about resurrection triumph then, but those words came back to me with such force as I saw this person soon to enter into eternity and the promise. Those scoffing words. Death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? And of course, the death and and the grave, they, they answer back. Sin. The law. And the apostle says, 
Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Jesus Christ. I moved from there and continue to, to read right up to the end of Scripture when we read of the glories of heaven and eternal life with Jesus Christ. I went home after spending several hours with the family. They seemed encouraged that her situation had it deteriorated to the point that her son was even even joking that this was all a stunt, that you know she just did it to bring the family together and stuff, and that she'd be out by the end of the week and 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 you know they just couldn't couldn't get rid of her. It's like she was making fun of them. Oh, you want me you want me to go, right? Well I'm sticking around a bit longer. And um, we, we, we had a, a few laughs about that. That she probably heard everything that we were saying and was just keeping her eyes closed to, uh, to tease us. She was that sort of person. Um, very sweet, very joyful. But behind those gleaming eyes was definitely... A bit of mischief, all in good fun. I woke the next morning to a call from Nina. Mums died ten minutes ago. Could you come back and say a few words at her bedside? It would have meant a lot to her, and it would mean a lot to us. So I did, and I read this psalm, and there to children who don't know the Lord, who don't believe in Him, one who, even after his mom's death, continued to make uh, comments about his atheism, I said, teach us to number our days. My last memory of Nikki is Sunday, sat in her chair, me taking her her plate, holding her hand, and praying with her one last time. And to think I was going to have one of the, the gents, Adrian or David or Michael, take her the plate. I would have missed that moment. Sorry, guys, you had to be the ones to, to miss out. But I was there. And enjoyed that moment. And that's my last memory of someone who, even though she had two cracked ribs and broken vertebrae and didn't know it, took the pain to make us some broccoli and cauliflower and send it across the street because she wanted to be involved. Not because she had to, but because she got to. That's great. Teach us to number our days. I crossed over from Whittington Hospital to North Middlesex Hospital directly after that visit to see my elderly 86-year-old neighbor, Dennis, going now on 87. As I entered, I saw a large family gathering, and I know when I see lots of people standing in the halls, what's going on. And moments later, I saw, I heard noise, and I saw them walking through the hallway to a room in private and weeping. Whoever they were there to see, they were there to say goodbye to. And that person had breathed their last. I don't know them. I didn't get a chance to speak to them. But I knew that someone had died. Another person had, in the words of this psalm, flown away. And there I saw my neighbor, Dennis, Himself about to be released. Well, he lost it when they told him he actually was going to have to stay in another day. Wasn't particularly happy. I wasn't particularly happy either. But we had to wait for them to fix a special bed for him in his house. The next day, I broke up his old bed and we built him a new bed, a medical bed. And it occurred to me that this would likely be his last bed. Teach us to number our days. 
While I was busy with all of that, waiting on the uh, transport to deliver Dennis back to his home, I got a text from our sister Janet. Janet had called me, actually, while I was in hospital the day before, and had said, I have something to tell you, but um, I, I, I need to tell you in person. So I went there, and it was clear that Janet was in the early stages, or maybe middle stages, rather, of, um, a, of a mental breakdown, a relapse into the uh, paranoid schizophrenia that she has wrestled with since her early 20s. I sat and she told me about people and entities and things that were very real to her, that were oppressing her and were terrifying her. And she, she knew at one level that, they, that, that, that there, there, there's a sense in which they were real and there's a sense in which they were not, perhaps. In any case, what was going on was at a minimum manipulated by the demonic to fill our sister with fear. And anxiety. I prayed with her and I said, I need to tell your 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 daughter, Jessica. Oh, it's okay, I can tell her. Don't don't ever let someone take that responsibility if you know um, she she would not have told her daughter and her condition would have continued to deteriorate. I told her I would tell her daughter, but to rest easy, to sleep well. I told her that I didn't deny these things coming into her house. I didn't deny that they were poking her in the eyes. I didn't deny that they were tearing her, her eyelashes out and stretching her nostrils and all sorts of weird, sick stuff. Rather, I said, if they come and do that, don't give them the pleasure of caving. Stand strong, because he who is in you is stronger. I called her daughter. Her daughter called her health team. Friday, I'm waiting on Dennis, and I get a text. They're coming to take me away. I won't leave hospital this time. Such was her fear of going back to uh, the, the uh, mental hospital that she, um, she thought this would well and truly be the last time that she would go in and she would not be released. I left Dennis's and went to hers and then while I was with her trying to calm her because she was screaming at the phone over her daughter just in anguish, I got a call that Oh, we're, we're, we, we're at Dennis's and we've left him inside. And I'm like, what? I get back and old 86-year-old man who can't barely walk is sat at the bottom of his steps, not able to do anything, just sat there. I tended to him, got him settled, got his milk, got him something to eat, then went back to Janet's. And once again, she was speaking with a friend and just in anguish. We read scripture together and prayed. And then I had the, um, the heartbreaking experience of after, after she calmed and after we were able to laugh together, actually, and tell a few jokes and enjoy a bit of banter in the moment, we prayed again. And I walked her to the van. It looks very much like a prison van, actually. And I hugged her and I waved her goodbye before it took her to hospital. She still maintains she doesn't think she'll get out. Lord, teach us to number our days. Why should we be taught to number our days? Why should we, out of what has been a a very sad and a very difficult week, um, uh, and if you were not walking through those things that I was, now perhaps you, 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 you see a glimpse of some of the things, just some of the things. Uh, why should you number your days? Why should I number our days? Isn't numbering our days a bad thing? Isn't that something that some bad guy in a film, some sort of mobster or whatever says, your days are numbered, sort of a dark threat? Um, you know, uh, it, it, yes, it is. Number your days so someone else doesn't have to number them for you. Realize that whether you like it or not, whether it's a bad person telling you or not, your days are numbered. 
Teach us to number our days because as verses 1 through, through, through 2 uh, teach us, God is invincible. He's been our dwelling in all generations. He, 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 he's the one who brought forth the mountains. He's before the, the mountains were brought forth. He's before the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And sometimes we, we, we think that we are invincible and we live life as though we are invincible and we act as though we are invincible and we look at others and we think they are invincible. And Nikki, 91 years old, trundling along down the, the road, still managed to exude some sense of invincibility. Such that someone sent a text, I thought Nan was invincible. I'm so hurt. I hope everyone's okay. And I read that psalm shortly after the family got that text and, uh, about their nan's invincibility. And, and I, I told them at the bedside to say God is invincible is to say that only God is invincible. Teach us to number our days because God is invincible. Teach us to number our days because man is perishable. Therefore, we must admit, we must come to terms with the reality that only God is invincible. That you will not live forever. That you are not, in the words of uh, dear brother Vic, must have been a decade or more ago, uh, said of of someone, I I just remember someone... uh, one of the local youths just sort of walking out in the traffic and you made a comment about some people thinking they're death proof. Um, and and, the, and I, I, I remember that um, because it's so accurate. We walk through life thinking and acting like we're death proof. Like, like nothing can, can happen to take us out that we, you know, we, we take for granted now. We take for granted this moment. We take for granted the possibility that we will even walk out the doors. We, we sometimes talk about, well, I could walk out the doors and be hit by a bus. Or you might not even walk out the doors. You remember that time? Nikki just barely walked out the doors and fell right in the door. I'm not going to lie. She was at that age when that happened. I thought it might, might be playing out in front of us. I thought this was it. She had that wonderful thick fur coat on. I think it provided a bit of cushioning. Or it would have been. Man is perishable. Verses 3 through 11 tell us that. And the thing is, it's God who makes us perishable. You return man to dust. You say, return, O children of man. God is invincible. A thousand years is in His sight is as but yesterday when it is past, but He sweeps us away with a flood, as with a flood. We're like, He says, a dream. We're here and then we're gone. I had a dream this past week and I forgot all about it. Until Ileana asked if, if I'd had a nightmare the night before. And I had. I, 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 there was some fox screaming in the back garden and apparently that was working its way into the sort of dreamscape that I had going and and I would, uh, you know, there was there was someone I don't know who who was in distress, and they were screaming, and uh, and then I was I was I won't say screaming, um, but I, I was yelling, sort of no, you know, and then someone's name over and over again, and um, apparently um, I, you know, was doing that so loudly in my dream world that when I uh, woke I woke myself up. I woke her up and I continued talking gibberish and then, um, and then I, I woke up and realized, oh, there's a fox outside. Totally forgot the dream until her question uh, reminded me. Your life is like that. Your life is here and then it's gone. Our life is, 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 is but a passing moment. William Shakespeare wrote uh, the, the lines, um, life is but a passing shadow that struts and frets its hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. 
Man is perishable. We, we, we are perishable, though, we must be honest, because of our sin. And thus the emphasis of this psalm in its first part is that we, we, we are, are swept away. We are like grass that withers and perishes, flourishes and then is renewed and then fades and withers. We, we are brought to an end by the righteous anger of God. And we must, we must affirm the righteousness of God, otherwise we would see His anger as malevolent and capricious and, uh, and just something that, that He throws out there just for the sake of it. But no, it's, it, 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 it's His wrath which is righteous because, verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There is not a one of us who could rightly in our own standing enter into the kingdom of the Lord. The unshakable kingdom that I spoke of at the beginning of this service was, it, it is not ours by our merits. It's ours only by Christ's merits. Every one of us is broken to the point of shattered. But Jesus Christ came down into our world and was broken for us so that He might put us back together. Jesus was broken for us so that he could take the, those who are broken and protect them from being broken still further under the righteous wrath and anger of God. And so God has set our iniquities before him. And this is the scariest thing. Our secret sins, those things that nobody knows about, that you've thought, said and done, that you think you've gotten away with, God knows. They're in the light of his presence. All of the Deeds that are done in darkness will be brought to the light. And God has every justification to, to judge us, to judge me. To say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that's scary. At one level. If that's all you know, and if that's all you have. We're called Grace Baptist Church for a reason. Fortunately, it's not all that we have. But the question is, do you live your life in the realization that it's not all you have? Our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. When I left Sister Nikki on Wednesday night, very late, she was actually breathing steadily. I left in full confidence that I might very well see her again still breathing and that she may be completely restored. Such was the strength and steadiness of her breathing by the time that I'd left. Um, I left. I'm told that she continued breathing in that way right up until very swiftly and suddenly Thursday morning it just changed. And what was steady if painful breathing due to the obstruction caused by the lungs uh, uh, to the lungs by the ribs and the vertebrae um, it just changed. And there were a few moments where she gasped and then she was with us no more. Like a sigh. I joked with the family that the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Nikki made it to 91. If you reach 80 by... By uh, reason of strength. You, know, you must be a really, really strong woman to get to, to 91. Just as you couldn't even leave it at 90. Just had to have that year. And actually, in the same way, when you're little, every little bit matters. You know, you, you say, um, you know, I'm, I'm two and a half or five and three months or something like that. It's that way at the end of life, too. <laughs> every little moment matters. 91 years and five months old. Hmm. But they're soon gone. 
It's far too short. This fan is but toil and trouble. And our sister, for all of her, her, uh, her joy, she radiated joy. I don't know if, uh, you know if all of you looked into her face or interacted with her quite as much as I did, but she radiated joy. Just her eyes gleamed. Her smile looked like it was so strong it would break her face off. It was just, it, it was amazing to see a sweet old lady, not a bitter old lady, not a jaded old lady. And you say, oh, she must have lived a happy life wrong. No. She suffered greatly. She was herself a refugee. Her husband had converted from Islam and was um, paying the price for that in his family, was shunned by his friends, was and she, she, she lived her life with all of that in the background. Her, her son rejected God. I mean, if you listen to him, you'd think he was an atheist from childhood. Another daughter did her own thing. Another daughter did follow through with trusting the Lord and married a pastor even. And her son is a pastor in St. Albans and was a large church of around a thousand people. And presumably he's standing this very moment and preaching to his congregation. He was with me actually when I prayed and read scripture to his grandmother. A faithful brother who knows and believes the gospel. But toil and trouble, toil and trouble, toil and trouble. And, 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 and it's all gone and it all flies away. And, and we don't stop to consider the power of God's anger. We don't stop to consider the wrath of God according to his fear. We don't stop to comprehend just how broken we are, just how sinful we are, just how deserving we are of his judgment. And therefore, we don't fully appreciate just how gracious God is. Just how full of rich love, abundant mercy and kindness he is. And that's why the psalmist, he doesn't end, he doesn't end on a depressing note. I don't want you to either. I know, I know some of what I've said probably seemed a bit intense. It's been one of those weeks, okay? Give me some grace. But teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I'm not saying this because I want to scare you. I'm not saying this because I want you to be disturbed or troubled. I don't want you to have nightmares. I don't want you to wake up in a cold sweat of, of trauma and grief. I want you to number your days and get a heart of wisdom. I want my last memory of you. If it comes to that. To be of someone who went out Loving the Lord and his people. Return, O Lord, he prays. How long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. God is invincible. Man is perishable. Teach us to number our days because of these things, but also teach us to number our days because our help in life and our hope in death comes from the Lord. That's why you should number your days. Because if you would know help through the toil and trouble of life, and if you would know hope in the trial and tragedy of death, that's going to come from the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. Therefore, I will trust in Him. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Says a man who, at the beginning of that lamentation, Lamentation 3, said, I'm the man who's seen affliction under the wrath of your rod, of your fury. My hope has perished even from the Lord, but this I call to mind. Therefore, I do have hope. You have hope if you have the Lord. Whatever Moses is experiencing, whatever his people are experiencing, however painful their present situation, God is able. God is strong. God is powerful. You're perishable, but God is invincible. 
Stop going to what's perishable and expecting it to be invincible. Go to what's truly invincible and cut out the middle man and find someone who can actually help you in time of need, who can actually give you hope in your dying moments. We see that God's disposition toward us impacts our disposition toward others. We see that God's work drives our work as we are satisfied with the steadfast love of the Lord emerging from the darkness of night into the morning of a new day. We are able to rejoice and to be glad all our days. Make us glad, he says, for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord be upon us and establish the work of our hands. God's work is what produces our work. God's love for us is what produces our love. The the joy of the Lord is our strength. Therefore, we trust in him because God has worked in us and God has worked for us. And we know this powerfully and personally in Jesus Christ. We are able to work out The salvation that God has already worked in with fear and trembling, with faithfulness and trust. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what what you went through this past week uh, additional to what I've already mentioned. I don't know what you'll go through in the coming weeks. Perhaps, and I I, I went inside because I'm going to have to go through it with you. Maybe this message is not about the past week. Maybe it's for you to prepare you for weeks ahead. When I was preaching through 1 Corinthians 15 at the end of the year, I said that, that God is preparing us for loss. I prayed against it, but it's going to happen because we're perishable. When our brother Michael preached his first message back in January and and spoke about spiritual warfare, I said that God was preparing us. And he said God's preparing us. God's given this to us because we are in the fight and we may be about to experience warfare of greater intensity from the satanic, from the demonic. Brothers and sisters, hold fast to God. He is your help in life. He is your hope in death. Trust the Lord. And he will establish the work of your hands. Yes, we are perishable, but God is invincible.